opportunities. At some point here, three transgressions here, he's told them to repent for the fourth time. And I said, it's over. It's enough. He's not just going to keep giving warning after warning after warning. He's going to bring them to, uh, to repentance, hopefully. But if they do not repent, then there's going to be problems that are going to come about. There's going to be punishment for what they're doing. Uh, parents sometimes will use the, the three warning thing. Uh, they'll, they'll count to three. One, two, and generally around two, hopefully your, your child will get the message and stop doing what they're doing. Sometimes the child won't. Sometimes the child will, will push the parents to see if, if they're really serious about the warning. But uh, maybe that was something that God's trying to show them here. One, two, three. Nope, fourth time it's going to happen. So Amos is warning not just Israel here and not really Judah, his own home nation there. He's really warning everybody. God will bring judgment upon all the nations if they will not uh, heed his word. And then there in chapters 1, verse 6, 9, 11, there's all the other warnings as well that God gives uh, to, to, uh, to, to Israel for their change. He wants to walk with them, Amos 3, verse 3. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? Well, the answer to that is no. If you have two people that are in disagreement, they're not going to walk together. There's going to be a conflict there. There's going to be some kind of argument always taking place. Well, Israel is not walking with God, so therefore they're not agreeing with God, so therefore they can't walk with God. If they were in agreement with God, then God would walk with them. But they're not doing so. And, and what we can learn from this as well, just because one is a child of God doesn't mean that he can just walk in any direction. Israel had this attitude about themselves that, hey, we're God's chosen people, we're, we're great, and we can do anything we want to do. Well, you can't do that. Uh, Christians have a way of, of, of walking in righteousness. We have to walk in the ways of God, and the way he has gotten us, the way he has given to us. So we can't just go out here and do what we want to do. Uh, there's things that we are to, what ways of behavior we are to live with. So Israel simply not walking with God. They're going in their own direction. And he's telling them right here that two, can two walk together? No. they got to be in agreement. And because of their attitude, chapter 4 and verse 12, they better get prepared to meet God. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. This is not a call for them to get right. That, that time has passed. He, he tried and tried to get them to repent and do right. But this is a call that understand that God's judgment is going to come upon them. It's coming. So prepare to meet your God. Prepare to have the wrath that God's going to place upon them. Uh, again, if they had just listened to Amos and these other prophets, they wouldn't have come to this part, to this point. And again, don't we know that if we go about in a disobedient way, that God's going to punish us? Well, God will punish us as individuals if we uh, just live a life of disobedience. We know that. He, he punished us like we do our own, our own children. We do our best to punish them, to go in the right direction. And God's going to punish his, these children of his right here because of, of, their, of their sin, of their rebellion. So he tells them, get ready, it's coming. Remember, they got about 35 years here before it's going to happen. So, uh, but will they, we're not going to repent. Are they going to listen? And the answer is no. Chapter 5 and verse 15. Here's what they're doing. It says, hate evil, love good. Establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. 
they have gotten so far away from God that they were beginning to love what was evil and hate what was good. They really got confused. And any time a person gets away from that, when they get away from the Word of God, you'll begin to hate things that are good. You'll begin to love things that are evil. And we can see it, can't we? You try to stand up for what is right and say a word that is good, and you'll be hated for it. Hated for standing for what is true. And yet that's what what the Lord said will happen. Romans 12 and verse 9, Paul says that love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, hate what is evil. What he's saying here, cling, hold on to what is good. Uh, but as a nation, can't we see our, our nation laughing at things that, that are right and then upholding things that are wrong? But maybe, you know, maybe things can turn around from that. Maybe things will turn around. But we've got to make sure, first of all, that I'm not personally, that I'm not falling into this trap of hating things that are good and loving things that are evil. And no good will come from that. Chapter 5 and verse 19, he's showing them that when this judgment comes, there will be no escape. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or as though he went to the house, leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. We're not going to be able to flee from the judgment of God. It's going to, it's going to catch up with us. We may think we can. Here's an individual here kind of using this as an illustration. A lion gets after him. Well, he, he escapes. He, get away, he gets away from the lion. He thinks everything's okay, and here comes a bear. Well, he escapes. He gets away from the bear. He runs to his house. He shuts the door. I'm safe. And he leans up on the wall. What happens? A snake bites him. We're not going to uh, escape God's judgment. God's judgment is coming to Israel. God's, God's judgment is going to come to us eventually. And we may, uh, may, we may be able to fool people what we're doing, but we'll never get away from God's judgment because he's, he knows all, he sees all. So again, the, Amos is warning there to Israel, he's going to get you. He's going to get you. The judgment, his judgment will come upon you. <clears throat> Chapter 5 of Amos 21 and 22. He says, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fattened peace, your fattened peace offerings. What if the Lord were to say to us, I despise when you come together. I wish you wouldn't even do it. Or I despise when you come together and you sing these songs. I wish you wouldn't do it. And I despise when you take the Lord's Supper because you're not, you're not doing it in, a, in a mentally the proper way. Or I despise it when you pray to me because uh, your life, it doesn't reflect one of a life of prayer. Well, that's what he's saying to Israel here. I despise your feast days, you know, those big three days uh, a year which they would, they would come together and, and celebrate either Passover or Pentecost or the Tabernacles. He, 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 he despises their coming there because their life's not right. Uh, he, I do not savor your sacred assemblies. He loved it when they would come together, but here he doesn't think much of it when they come together. Though you, burn, though you offer me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I'm not going to accept them because it's not right. Your life is not right. So are we doing what God tells us to do in the right way, in the right mindset? Are we doing these things? Is our heart right as we do these things? Uh, 
sometimes uh, our life is in shambles, such as this. And that's not good. And God doesn't, doesn't want that. We may come to church, assemble, think everything's great, and then leave and start the sinning process over. What have we learned from it? We haven't learned anything. Living the lie. God, that's what Israel was doing here, to live in this lie. And God is saying, I'm not accepting anything you offer up to me because of this lie that you're living. <clears throat> Chapter 6 and verse 1. Woe to you who are at ease in Zion and trust in Mount Samaria. Notable persons to the in the chief nation to whom the house of Israel comes. They're at ease, even though Amos has warned them and warned them. They're not taking him serious. Now, they had a lot of prophets that told them the things they wanted to hear. They had prophets that would tickle their ears. Oh, you're doing such a good job. The Lord is pleased with how you're doing these things. And then here comes... Amos or some of these other prophets and telling them you listen to the wrong people here these are false prophets you're not listening to them you shouldn't be listening to them you're at ease and here uh, they're about to face God's judgment how can they be at ease when they're facing the judgment that's going to come to them so Listen to the warnings that God gives us and how we are to live in a, in a righteous way, in a godly way. Listen to those ways to live. And don't be at ease thinking that everything's good. Listen to those who want to tickle our ears, you might say. Tell us things we want to hear. Everything's going great. But Israel is about to see the judgment of God. They're about to be overrun by the enemy. And they will be destroyed and will not be heard from again. And so Amos is trying to tell them that to get them to understand the seriousness. Chapter 7, verse 12. <clears throat> then Amaziah, now Amaziah, uh, the king here, and Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah, there eat bread, and there prophesy. So Amaziah is the king. He wants Amos to go back home, go back to the Judah, and tell them these things. They don't need him. They don't want to hear him. So flee to the land of Judah. Eat your bread there and tell them. We don't have anything to do with this. So uh, Amos didn't do it. He continued to preach and teach the people about what God had. But uh, Jewish history tells us about a little bit about how Amos died. It tells us that Amaziah's son, the king, had a son. And for whatever reason, I don't know who told him to do this, but Amaziah's son was a priest. He got enough of it. And he goes and he kills Amos with a club and beats him to death with a club. Uh, all because they didn't like the message that he was having to say. So Amos, Amos if, he had, if he had gone home, went back to Judah, and there, just forget about Israel, he probably would have lived a longer life. But he did what God told him to do, and there, because of, of such cost him his life. 2 Timothy 4.2 Paul says preach the word be instant in season out of season reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Uh, there will be times when God's message will not be liked. Even among God's people. Even among Christians. There will be times there will be topics that will not be appreciated. And uh, if it's true, then it's true. We need to accept it. 
if we find ourselves not liking it, we might need to examine ourselves. Why am I not liking this? What's the problem? So, uh, Amos did his job. And if this is true, it cost him his life for doing his, doing his job. And then chapter 8 and verse 11 Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God. I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. A famine. No, they have plenty to eat, but they're just not going to listen to the words. They're not going to hear the words that God has to say to them. People are not being taught the truth in, in Israel's day. Again, these false prophets who are saying these things, who are just tickling their ears. There's a famine if the truth is not being taught. And that's something that God wants us to teach. He wants us to teach the truth. Even if nobody listens, the truth is to be taught. But yet many have caved in to uh, teach what the people want to hear. And, and uh, be pleasing to them. And don't worry about what God says. God's way is not right. God's way, does, God's way is too old, too out of date. We need to change things. Uh, that way certainly is going to bring about failure. Uh, teach what God says to do. And, uh, then we, we, and we'll be faithful to him and his ways. So that's just the oversight of the book of Amos without going verse by verse but you see what Amos is up against and that's what many of these other minor prophets up against trying to get the people to change get the people to repent and uh, God gave them time but they refused to do so and they paid the price I think it was 596 when no 7 something 596 is when Judah got taken. Seven, seven something, seven, year seven something, 700 and something, when they got overtaken. Israel did, not to be heard from again. All right, a few minutes early. Uh, we'll, we'll end here, and, and next week we'll look at another minor prophet.
Good morning. Welcome to the Vernon Church of Christ for our Sunday morning worship service. Uh, we ask that you would fill out the attendance cards and drop them in the basket. And there is an announcement sheet that's printed out in the foyer. For sick this morning, uh, Freddie Maddox is getting good reports concerning his eye condition. Lavola Rector is home recovering from a fall. Steve Morton has begun taking cancer treatments. Jerry Neighbors, Sherry Randolph's father, will have additional eye surgery on June 21st. And the congregation extends its sympathy to Frankie Wallace in the death of her relative, Mary Coleman. Our shut-ins are Robbie Collins, Lola Mae Edwards, J.C. Hutchison, Martha Rye, Joe C., Norma Stanford, and Mary Thomas. For our upcoming activities uh, this week, on June 23rd, we'll have a 7th through 12th, the 7th through 12th grade and age group will meet at the Mexican restaurant to eat and then go back to the building to play games. On June 24th, there will be a door knocking for VBS at 9.30. On June 25th through the 28th, we'll have VBS here. And June 29th, there will be a cleanup for VBS at 8 a.m. Uh, for VBS teachers, that, that you can pick up your material for it in the fellowship room. And the pantry is getting low. Uh, we have plenty of green beans, but if you could help with any food items, it would be appreciated. Let's go to God on behalf of our sick and shut in. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day and for this time you've allowed for us to come together and worship you. On the first day of the week, we ask that you be with those who are on our sick list and who are, who are shut in. We ask that you would give them a restful day. We, we pray for Frankie Wallace and her family and the death of her relative. In Jesus' name, amen. To have better focus our minds on giving this morning, we'll be singing Holy, 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 the first and fourth stanzas. <clears throat> holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning, our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God over all and blessing eternally. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all the world shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty. Thank you for everything we have in our lives, God, because we know everything comes from you. 
We want to give back a portion this morning, Father, and you bless us with. Maybe we can do our part to help somebody that needs help. In Jesus' name we humbly pray. Amen. To help center our minds on partaking of the Lord's Supper, this morning we'll be singing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, all four stanzas. When I survey the received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you that for sending your Son to die on the cross for our sins, Lord, and just to give us another day to live and glorify you, Lord. We want to pray this time that we take this bread which represents your Son's body that was shed in a pleasing manner to you. In your name we pray. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, in like manner we come to you and pray that we uh, take this uh, fruit of the vine which represents the blood that was shed of your Son on the cross, Lord, in a pleasing manner to you. Just be with us this day. In your name we pray.
Ah, oui, oui, pas We thank you again, Lord, for this day and all the many blessings that you continue to bestow upon us. We thank you for the great sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on the cross for our sins. Thank you for the church that he established. Thank you especially for the congregation of that church that meets here. We thank you for each member, each family, each person, and the things that they represent to the congregation. I thank you today especially for the fathers of the congregation, for the leadership they provide in their homes, for the examples that they set for all of us. Please be with them and continue to bless them as they strive to serve you. We pray today for those of our number that are sick and shut in and not able to attend with us. Please be with them, be with those attending to them that they may be better t tomorrow than they are today. We thank you for the young people of this congregation and the work that they do and the efforts they make to serve you. Please continue to be with them and bless them in all that they do. Thank you for Brother Eddie and Landon and their families and the work that they continue to do for us here at Vernon. Please bless them and, and give them a long life and nice service. We ask you now to continue with us on through this day. Forgive us for our sins as we repent and turn from them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs>
We began this morning with this question. Do I have to go to church and go to heaven? Many have asked that particular question over the years, and many know the answer to that question. And there are many who don't know the answer to that question. But what does the Bible have to say about this particular question? Do I need to go to church in order to go to heaven? Now, many individuals, they may be have sickness, whatever it may be in their life, and they're not able to attend. And, of course, those who have reasons, uh, they understand that. They understand they can't be here every service or whatever. But, but from the standpoint, from us as individuals, what about it? We're healthy, and we've got plenty of energy and plenty of opportunity and time. So do I have to go to church in order to go to heaven? A spin-off question on this would be, do I have to attend Sunday evening? Do I have to attend Wednesday evening in order to, in order to go up to heaven? And when it comes to answering these questions, I want to speak as kindly as I can about this. And I want to be as truthful as I can about this. I'm not mad. I'm not got an axe to grind or anything. I'm just trying to tell us what the Bible has to say, what God wants us to know about it and the importance of it. But there are those individuals, Christians, who absolutely hate to miss a service. And they are individuals who are committed to coming every time the doors open, whether it be a vacation Bible school or a gospel meeting or, or a regular service on Sunday, Sunday night and Wednesday. And there's some individuals I've seen that they would have every reason to stay at home because of the health that they're in. But they are determined, I'm going to be there because I love the Lord. I love his word, I love the people, I love the church, and they're there, and they're here when that time comes to assemble. And then there are those who may be looking for any reason or any excuse to not attend. And anything will do for them, they'll look and try to find reasons for such, and, and often it may be an inconvenience for them to, to attend. It may be that they are got other things they want to do that's more important than to attend, and and well, it's, it's always been that way. But yet, I think the Word of God stands where He wants us to come and to assemble together. He wants us to do that. So, when it comes to this question, do I have to attend every service of the church in order to go to heaven? What does the Bible have to say? In Malachi chapter 1, in verse 13, we don't want to be like, like uh, Israel did here when it came to their worship of God. Here the Lord says to them, or they're saying to the Lord, Oh, what shall, oh, what a weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord. When it came to the worship of God, they were saying, What a weariness. I don't really want to do this i got other things I'd rather be doing besides how, how, how often do I have to go? And here we go with these excuses or reasons, and Israel is doing that very thing. I hope we never say that it is a weariness in order for us to come together and worship, that it's a burden for us to come together and worship, that I really had rather be somewhere else when it comes to our time of worship. I hope we never say that. Because if we do, then we may find that our worship, our personal worship may be rejected by God as he was rejecting here the offerings that they were bringing to him. So just how much do I have to do? How many times do I have to attend? Well, go back before COVID hit, and there's, I don't know of any church that hasn't been affected because of COVID. When COVID hit, our numbers were a certain Average, and then after COVID, you look and numbers were down. That did something. It did something that got people not necessarily not wanting to come to church, but it got them realizing, well, I don't have to go. I can stay here. I can stay home because for a while there, we're having to do everything by the, you know, the Internet and such as that. Well, we got back to going, doing things. Well, all of a sudden, the people aren't there. Well, where are they? And some congregations even had the numbers where they decided there were no more people that are here on Sunday night. Why don't we just cancel Sunday night service? And many of them did. Wednesday night was the same thing. 
all because when COVID hit, something happened. The people began to say, well, I don't need to be there. And Wednesday night services were canceled. And there's some congregation that said, we're going to try this. We're going to try to have a, a Bible study in the morning, say 10 o'clock. Then we'll have a worship period at, at uh, you know, uh, 1045. And then after that first worship, we will have a little break. And then we'll try a second worship. And we'll all be out by 12. And they just knew that's going to work. That's going to do great. But you know what happened? Well, the people came to the Sunday school and they came to the, to the first worship. But during that 15-minute period, many of them left. They left, went home. Again, they look at that as, well, I don't need to be there. No need for me to be. Well, sometimes uh, maybe some of these congregations cancel services like that just to soothe a conscience of individuals. I don't know, but really, we don't want to be like they were in Malachi. We don't want our worship to come as a time of weariness, a time of burden. I don't really want to do it. I'd rather be somewhere else. And that's what happened to Israel. Look what happened to them. They got carried away into captivity. So when it comes to that question, why do we assemble on a weekly basis anyway? Why do we come together anyway to do this? And well, Isaiah 118 says, come, let us reason together. We need to have a reasoning as to why we assemble why we do this, God already knows why we assemble. He already knows why we're here personally on an individual standpoint. He wants us to know, he wants to know uh, what do we think about it? We need to reason together, come together. Why do we assemble? Some individuals, when, they, when it comes to the assembly, uh, they look at God as being a tyrant or a dictator, somebody that uh, demands everybody serve him. They demand that uh, God demands everybody bow down to him, worship him, tell him how great he is. And they will say, I don't want to serve a God like that. I want a God who will let me have freedom. Let me do what I want to do. I want a God on my own terms. I want a God that I create in my own image. And remember, we created the image of God. But many want a God they can create in their image. Well, why do we assemble? When it comes to Hebrews chapter 10, we're pretty familiar with verses 24 and 25, which we will get to here in a moment. But in the first 21 verses, it is here that the God is trying to explain to the people about their coming together to worship. And he says the law here in these first 21 verses, he's saying the law is, is a good thing. It was a good thing because it was a shadow of things to come, how things are going to be better. We did it this way. We had these bulls and goats and, and the sheep and things, and we sacrificed them, and the blood was shed. But he's saying here there's going to be a better way that's going to happen. And sure enough, Christ appears on the scene. He comes, and for some three years there, he shows us the way of, of serving God, of serving one another, loving one another, how we are to love God, and all these things he shows us. He's the perfect lamb. And yet what does mankind do to him? We slaughter him and we kill him. And his blood was shed, but it wasn't for nothing. It was in God's plan for him to come to this earth and to live a perfect life for us and to give his life so if we wanted to, heaven could be our home if we wanted to. Well, he leaves that up to us if we want to go to heaven or not. And the forgiveness, we couldn't go before God, what the writers say in those first 21 verses. We couldn't go before God unless Christ came and, and died for us. Beforehand, you had to go through a priest or somebody like that, and he would go to God on your behalf. But now because of this sacrifice of the perfect lamb, we can go before God. We can stand at his throne, and we can worship him there as we are today. We can do that. And then we come to verse 22 of Hebrews 10. He says here three times, let us. Let us do something. Three times here. Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Because of what Christ did, let us go before God. Let us do so with our hearts sinless. We can do that. We go before God and because we cleanse a true heart, we want to be here. I'm not just uh, saying the words. 
I'm not just here to satisfy somebody else. I am here because I want to be here. Because I want to worship God. I want to thank Him for sending of His Son to die for me so that one day I can be in heaven. I want to thank Him for that. I want to draw near to God. Well, worship is one way we draw near to Him. Verse 23 there, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. Let us hold fast that hope. The hope he is speaking of here is the hope that we have in God, which is never going to fail. Now, sometimes we'll say, well, I hope, I hope it doesn't rain today. Well, it may or may not. But when I say hope when it comes to God, without wavering, I know God's going to come through on that. His promise is going to be certain. He is not going to fail. He has never gone that back on a promise, and his promise of us, so one day being with him in heaven, well, I have hope in that. 100% hope that God will do what he said. And then in verse 24, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Consider one another. We're here, we fellowship, we talk, and we probably this morning have learned some things about others around that maybe we didn't know before we got here. And now we have an opportunity that we can pray for this individual. We can maybe offer assistance to this individual any way that we can. But we need to consider one another because I love you, my fellow brethren here. I want to help you any way I can. And I want to be of good works to you or really anybody that I, can, that I know about. And sometimes we don't hear about this or know about this until we come together and we consider one another and think about one another, and it's not just about us. It's not just about us. And then he comes to verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the matter of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. There were some here that were forsaking the assembly. The assembling together, they were forsaking. And here the writer is reminding him, don't do this. Don't do this. Look forward to that next time, that next opportunity that you have to come together in which we can build one another up. And look forward to that time when we can worship God, a time of encouragement. So much that goes along with it. But these, some of these individuals, they had stopped. They were not encouraging. They were not helping all of a sudden, before you know it, they were gone. They're out. No more there it was with them. And you notice there in verse 25, he talks about the assembling, not the assembly. The assembling, when we come together. When we come together, we are to be here, if at all possible. Again, what I say, I speak with kindness, and I speak with truth. And I, again, no axe to grind, not mad at anything. But you know, there are some here this morning that have no intention to come back tonight. Why? If we say we love the Lord, why don't we have that intention? Why is that the case? What does it say about my love for God? I say I love Him, but yet... Maybe I don't show it. How many times does a parent have to tell their child, I love you? Once a day, why if a parent were to say, go to the child, how many times a day do you need to hear from me that I love you? One time a day? Or how about once a week? Or how about once a month? Do you really love your child if you can't tell them? Really? Really? We wouldn't say that. What kind of parent would that be to say, tell me the amount of times that i got to say this in order for you to believe that I love you? What about our spouse? When we got married, how often do we need to tell them that we love them? What if you were to say, before we got married, I want to know how many times a day I need to tell you I love you for this marriage to work. The one might be thinking, what? I mean, you got, you got to have a set amount of times that you think I need to hear. 
Or what if one were to say, or say the husband were to say to his wife, how many days a year do I need to be at home? Do I need to be in this house for you for us to have a good marriage? I thought you want to be with me all the time. Why do you want to start picking and choosing the days you want to be here? If you love me, wouldn't you want to be with me all the time? Probably if before the marriage happened, if one were to say that to the other one, how many times do I need to tell you that I love you? How many times do I need to be at home? That probably, that marriage probably wouldn't happen. I wouldn't suggest it happen if somebody were to say that up front. So we ask the Lord sometimes, how many times do I have to be at church in order to go to heaven? Do I have to attend all the services? What's that saying about my love for God? What's it saying? Christ was asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? Here's what he said, Mark 12, 29 and 30. The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. First and foremost, love the Lord with every part of your being. Your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind, Every part we are to put God first, to love him. You see, my love for the Lord has a direct bearing on my love for the church. My love for the Lord has a direct bearing if I want to, I want to be of God's people or not. My love for the Lord has a direct bearing if I want to be somewhere else besides be, being with God's people when we come together. Hugo McCord, you may recognize him, he is a in the church, a great scholar. He passed away a few years ago. But he graduated college from Free Hartman. And uh, he was invited to speak at their 50th uh, reunion, class reunion. So he, he took up and he spoke. And, and uh, one thing he spoke about was how in over 50 years, how things had changed. In 50 years from what it was when he was uh, just a 18, 19 year old young man going there to make a preacher. And, and one thing he said how things really changed was uh, the dating process. So he, he went there and met a girl, fell in love with her, and eventually he married her. He was his, that was his wife. He met her there at Freed Hardman. And he talked about uh, during that time, during the lunch and supper times, the boys and girls couldn't sit at the same table. They had to be separated. You couldn't sit with your girlfriend. And he wanted to sit with his girlfriend, but couldn't do it. He had to go by that rule. During the week, if you walk from place to place on campus and you walk with your girlfriend, you couldn't hold her hand. No holding of her hand. And he said, I really wanted to hold her hand. But if I did, it wouldn't have gone so well. Dating. You could only date on Saturday night and Sunday night. Only time you could date. And then there was a curfew, 9 o'clock. You had to be back at your dorm room at 9 o'clock. And if you left campus with your date, you had to have a chaperone, and you had to pay for the chaperone's expenses if you left on Saturday, Friday, or Saturday or Sunday night. Now, his problem was he, he was preaching, and he, a little distance away, he had to leave on a Saturday night to get to where he was going. So he'd be rested and fresh Sunday morning. And then after Sunday night service was over, time he got back to Freed Harman, there was no time to see his girlfriend. He said, I miss that. I really miss seeing her. I wanted to see her. But, he said, the congregation where he was preaching at gave him one Sunday a month off. One Sunday. And he said, you know what? I look forward to that Sunday being off because that meant I was off Saturday. That meant my girlfriend and I could be together, you know, on the Saturday. And if we wanted to leave campus, whatever, we could on Saturday night. And then we went to church on Sunday and we still have Sunday night to be able to get, uh, be together. <coughs> and he said, do you think I made other plans knowing that that's going to be the one time that month I could be with her? No way would he make any other plan except to be with her because she was my girlfriend. She was my girl. I was loving her more and more every day. 
And sure enough, eventually we married. And they were married for many, many years. If we have that feeling, I'd rather be somewhere else than to be at worship and to be with God. I might want to look at my relationship with God and my relationship with the Lord in every way possible. <clears throat> because, again, remember, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what it's about. Church attendance is a sign of that love. It's a sign of that love, what, what I value most in life. We love our, our, our mates, our spouses. We love our children. There are signs and things that show just how much we love them. And there are signs as well that show that how much we love the Lord. Remember, God doesn't need our worship. We need to worship. We need God. We need him in our life. And the more we have in our life, the stronger we'll be. The more we learn of his word, the stronger we will be. And better, better ourselves to go against the temptations of Satan when he throws them up at us. And hopefully we can, we can battle them off and not give in to them. This morning, if you're not a child of God, why not become that child of God and, and begin your, your walk with him today? Loving the Lord with all your body, soul, mind, strength, everything about you. Love him and, and great things can come about. And one day, the greatest of all will be that in heaven when we stand before God there to be with him all eternity. If you're not a child of God, why not be baptized in Christ? Begin your walk this morning. Or as a child of God, you realize maybe my love's not what it should be. It can be better. It may be something you need to start where you're at. It may be we need to pray together for a greater strength that we all can do better on this. Because we can do better in our love for our Lord. This morning, that need is there. Come as we stand and sing our invitation.